All right. Hello there, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Mishmocha. And I'm the Viper. And this is episode eight of the Town Center, your monthly podcast dedicated to all things Age of Empires. And this is going to be the last episode of 2023. Uh, Christmas is just around the corner, and you can tell that's the case because it's getting freaking cold in here. What, what are you going to do for Christmas? First of all, I mean, the snow is gone already. It was snowing a couple of weeks back. Oh, it's surely going to come back, right? I it, hope always, so. it always makes it come uh, back. But then again, I haven't seen the snow during Christmas while I lived in Germany. So Interesting. Look it's at you in t-shirt and all that stuff. I'm Norwegian Viking, man. This is this is nothing. This is summer weather in Norway. <laughs> this is a peak spring for you. <laughs> uh, what am I doing for Christmas? I'm just going to spend it with family in Germany, like with Debbie's uh, side of the family. In Germany? Yeah. Uh huh. We were in Norway last year, so Germany this year. And yeah, we'll see what happens next year. And mm-hmm. you? Yeah, for me, my parents are coming. Mm. Uh, they're coming from Portugal. Well, they're mostly coming for the grandkids. Of yeah. course. They course. actually have three now. My brother just became a father oh, a, couple, a couple of days ago. But he, uh, well, thank you. Uh, his wife is Brazilian, so they're spending Christmas in uh-huh. Brazil, uh, which means they only have Germany to, mm. <laughs> to come to and sort of endure the cold. Mm. Uh, in any case, today's show, in today's show, our guest will be Tonio Schachinga. Mm. Uh, a tricky name, isn't it? Can you say it? Tonio Schachinga. Well, I think mine Schachinga. Was, I think mine was better. I'll, I'll, I'll rate it a 7 it's out like of 10, bruv. Chess singer. Chess. Schach is chess, no? In German. Oh, interesting. I have no clue if that... Oh, yes? Yeah. All right. But you don't oh. trust me, bro? <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> totally, totally. I know my German. <laughs> totally. Uh, Tonio is an Austrian author, and he has won what I'm told is one of the most prestigious literary awards in the German-speaking mm. world, the Deutsche Buchpreis. Um, now, what's an Austrian author doing in Age of Empires 2 podcast, you ask? A very good question, my friend. But believe it or not, Age of Empires plays a big role. In the plot of Tanya's book, mm. uh, Echt Zal- Zeitalter, Echt Zeitalter. Real time, stra- uh, time age, real time. No, wait, Echt, uh, yeah, Echt, Echt is real, right? Forget it, bro. Forget it. It's probably Zeit- RTS in German. Real time, age time. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Time. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read the book, and mm-hmm. there's a lot more Age of Empires than I was expecting to see. Like, okay. a lot more. I was so surprised by it. I mean, you make an appearance. Uh, T9 it makes a cameo. There are very strong indications that Leary uh, was mm. the inspiration for the main character of the book. So we're going to have a short interview with Tonio and so, uh, sort of hear all about those things. But before we talk to Tonio, it's been one month uh, since Viper's returned to Twitch. So it's time to oh, hear yeah. his first impressions on how things have developed so far for him and what kind of an impact his and T90's return have had for the scene as a whole. Yeah. Uh, then the preparations for NAC have now kicked into high gear. Mm-hmm. We're recording this on Sunday morning, yeah. which means the finals of the first qualifier will be played later today. We had uh, some juicy results yesterday. Some juicy results so far, indeed. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the announcement of NAC 5 has been sort of a bittersweet moment for the whole community, I feel like. True. Because on one hand, we have NAC hype, but on the other hand, uh, Nelly has also announced this will be his last NAC, and he'll stop streaming full-time. Allegedly. I still have hopes that Ooh, in the okay. future. Okay. It's my own personal hope. Okay. But okay. That, okay. I, I like mean, obviously, he's saying that it's the last one, but you know. Well, you know, one does not simply quit Age of Empires, exactly. right? <laughs> we, we've learned about that before. Uh, okay, so we'll talk about Warlords 2 and the Cartographers, the mm-hmm. two high profile tournaments that. Uh, ran through November and early December. And last but not least, since it's the last episode of the year, we will sort of make an, an, an assessment of the year as a whole, you know? Was it a good year for Age of Empires? Was it a bad year? Our favorite events, our favorite moments, stuff like that. As always, now I don't even know what camera to look at, as always. So many. <laughs> <laughs> very important, my friends. Your support is very important to us, and that's what allows us to keep bringing you these episodes. So if you do enjoy the work you're doing here, please, do consider again. I don't know what to look at. <laughs> do consider subscribing to the channel. We're now officially at five thousand subscribers, which is amazing. Uh, but on the new channel, on the new, new channel. channel, after two months or something, I mm. think that's pretty good. That uh, is but solid. We, we want more. Yes, and you know it's important to show our bosses here at GL that uh, the community enjoys the content. So please do consider helping us out. Because their boss is scary. Yeah, the Trust. bosses are scary. It's free and it means a lot to us. Uh, if you listen to our show on Spotify, please do not forget to rate us five stars. All right, Twitch, Orion. It's been yes. a month since you're back. Yes. What are your first impressions? The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> we want to hear all about it, bro. All right, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, first of all, it's been a really fun month back on Twitch, right? Uh, it's obviously a little bit of a different world now with the viewership and the activity in chat. Uh, a lot more fun, right? The, yeah, the, the comeback was super hype. Uh, 
I think my editor did a great v- job on the videos I had to like announce my comeback as well. So it was really Both fun. Both you and Dinari. Those yeah. were very, very nice videos. Uh, to like see the reaction from people to those videos and like the hype when the saxophone started playing was a oh, goosebump moments for me. Uh, so that was really cool. I was, yeah, obviously uh, I'm ha- very happy with the viewership as well. It's kind of back to what it used to be mm-hmm. uh, when I left as well. So that was always like a question mark. How good is the viewership going to be when you get back? And yeah, I would say it's pretty much the same. And like, we've had already a couple of big events right where viewership has gone even past what i was expecting Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean negatives would be that it's still like it's it's still twitch in terms like they're the way they're putting ads right now like if you don't accept their like three minutes of ads per minute uh, per hour (laughs) three minutes per minute (laughs) uh, three minutes per hour you get way less revenue percentage of the ad revenue itself right Mm -hmm. so they're kind of forcing everyone to have three minutes at least per per hour which, yeah, that's what I've noticed as well, because I always get like a pop-up warning. Ads are starting in five minutes. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm in the middle of what the game. What are we doing right? now? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I have an option to like snooze for a little bit, but it's like you, after three snoozes, it will force through. So it's like, I always feel a bit bad about that. And also like when I'm reading chat and I didn't realize the ads started playing, I suddenly like look back in chat and then like ads, ads, ads. And like everyone's like missing the moment. I'm just, ah. So I feel like I have to address the ad situation quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I could obviously turn it down to like half a minute of an ad per hour, but then my revenue will drop extremely low, right? And the ad revenue, honestly, on Twitch is pretty solid these days. Mm-hmm. So uh, don't judge any players for or any streamers for wanting to have that at least three minutes, right? That's interesting to hear because a couple of years back, I seemed mm. to have this idea that ads didn't give all that much. So yeah. nobody really cared about running ads or not running yeah. ads, right? I mean, people did run ads, but yeah, it definitely feels like it's paying more now than it did before. So mm-hmm. I, I understand why Twitch as well are pushing the ads so much right, because right. they're probably making a lot more as well with that, right? So it all adds up. And it, it's a good way to make revenue with all the um, subscription drops, right? In terms of uh, the local um, prices where a sub from a certain country will pay less than a sub from another country, right? right so right, right. the ads are a good compensation for that. So yeah, in the end, I, those, that is negative for me, but it's also positive, right? Because I think it means a lot of other people can also make a better living from Twitch, right? Without depending on the subs as much. So mm. there's pros and cons to everything, right? But mm-hmm. yeah, overall, still back on Twitch. Uh, it feels amazing. Get a lot more energy from streaming with the chat being so active and all. And yeah, my first month back has been amazing. I'm so torn on ads because on one hand, it's, well, it's just annoying. Mm. <laughs> you know, you're watching a game and all of a sudden, but on the other hand, it's how Twitch makes money. It's how you guys make money, as mm. you just said. So what do you do there? Do you just make them less intrusive? What do you do there? I, I'm not sure what the correct option is. It's also a thing where it's, it, it is still a free service, right? Someone right. has to pay for it. Right. Some, it right. has to be paid for someone, right? If so. you don't want to pay for it, if yeah. you want to watch it for free, which is fine, mm. you can't ask too much, though, yeah, exactly, right? right? Uh, so three minutes of ads per minute isn't... It, it's just... I mean, it's not... A, I don't think people are bothered about that, but it's, it's the timing, right? Where it suddenly shows up in the middle of a game or middle of a hype moment or... Yeah, in, even in tournaments as well, right? Uh, if I'm casting the cartographers or whatever, suddenly, like, ads start playing in the middle of a two-hour Black Forest, right? Yeah, it's, those kinds of situations yeah. are are obviously bad. Yeah. Um, so during your first stream after the comeback, I think it was pretty obvious you were sort of overwhelmed yeah, by yeah, the yeah. amount of viewers yeah. and the amount of support you got. Uh, but once things sort of settled in the days after, I was surprised to see it really just felt like you had never left. You mm. know, the vibe of your stream was the same it always yeah. was. Was that how it felt like for you too? Yeah, it felt like the first stream was obviously very special. But then like after the second, third and fourth stream, it's like, oh, this is, ju- we're just back to business, right? But I mean, it's like, it's, it was the same while I was on Facebook, right? It just, I'm still just doing the same thing, right? I'm right. just live there hanging, talking to my viewers, having fun and mm-hmm. trying to have some fun with Age of Empires, right? So in the end, I guess the vibe just comes by itself as well. But uh, obviously the environment on Twitch with the chat and everything is quite different with all the memes and uh, <laughs> uh yeah, they, they have a lot of animated emotes as well now. And yeah, you can have a lot of fun on Twitch with chat. It's so interesting because if you would explain to somebody that that's a big part of Twitch, mm. most people would likely not understand why is it a big part, you know, that yeah. it can make emojis or, or even though maybe you know now because of all the, you know, all, yeah. all, all, all the success of emojis and, and GIFs and stuff like that. But it is a crucial part of the Twitch experience, I feel like. <laughs> For sure. I mean, like, if I was, like, to be frank, the video player on YouTube is far superior when it comes to live streaming. Okay. But still, the environment and the feeling and the atmosphere in the Twitch chat is just still something else. On yeah. YouTube, for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. for, uh, the, yeah. the player seems to be a lot better. You can rewind as well. Mm. Uh, something I was just thinking about the other day. I think you had close to 3,600 subs at the end of November. Mm. And then December arrived and the number went down to, I think, 2,100 or something. Yeah. 
which is still a big number and really it's impressive uh, that you're able to maintain such a high level of subscribers as well. But this is a reality you didn't have on Facebook, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, on Facebook, you had a fixed amount of money you would get regardless of how many followers or whatever they call subscribers over there. Yeah. Does that change the way you act on stream? Are you like, okay, let me try to be entertaining now because I need to keep the viewers or let me not play another game because they might go away. Does it yeah. change the way you think and you act? I would say no. Like on Facebook, obviously, I, on Facebook, I was not like sponsorships, no. Uh, pushing donations, no. And all that was like, I did not care because mm-hmm. I, had, I had my like fixed revenue so I didn't have to like, in quotes, sell out, you know. Uh, on Twitch, it's obviously a bit different in the fact that I, I have a lot more subs, a lot more donations, all those things come in. So I, and I want to show my gratitude, right? So I want to always shout them out and such. So that takes a little bit of um, time on the stream, but it's also, I mean, it gives me time to interact, right? With a fun sub message or whatnot. Mm-hmm. So it, it changes in that regard, but it's not like I'm suddenly like feeling forced to do more different things in order to try and get more subs and everything, right? My, my whole approach to streaming ever since I started has been... I'll deliver as good of a show and enjoy myself as much as possible uh, because if I enjoy myself, I think the viewers enjoy themselves more as well. And I'll do that for free. And if, if people deem that worthy of subscribing and supporting, then that's up to them, right? And I, I think that's a solid business model to have because if you try to really force things or like, yeah, f- gift five subs or do this and I do that, right? Uh, yeah, it's not the, the thing I want to do because I, I want to be able to just do what I want to do and have fun and hopefully people like that mm-hmm. and, you know, it they, as I said, they want to support it. Obviously, but on the other hand, would you say that while we're on Facebook, you had this feeling like, okay, it's okay if I don't try hard right now because uh, uh, since when, that when did I ever try time? hard? <laughs> well, well, okay, <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. No, no. I mean, what was on Facebook was okay. I, I didn't feel as bad if I played AV4, for example, because mm. sure people still came and was like, oh, AV4 sucks, blah blah blah, right? Because uh, they wanted to see me play AV, AV2. So that I did shove a little bit to the side. That like I didn't feel the pressure of okay, I have to play this game for viewership or right, that. Right. Now it's more like I, was, I mean I don't I would still play AV4 if I wanted to, right? I'm I'm doing it with Grubby, You did right? it. Yeah, I saw so, it once. Yeah. So like I just tell people if you if you're gonna bring negativity and want to shit talk AV4, just get the hell out of here. I don't want that shit here. Uh, but like um, I, I don't I don't feel any pressure in that regard of like oh I have to do things to satisfy my viewers and that yeah because in the end like I said I want to do what I want to do and hopefully people will enjoy that and support that but I do understand that people want to see me play certain things because that's what they've always seen right but yeah personally no no I don't feel the pressure to okay, deliver cool. in that regard uh, in terms of viewership pretty much what most people are expecting to happen did indeed happen uh, among the regular Age of Empires 2 streamers both Hue and T90 had the highest average viewership uh, in November there were like some variety streamers but they streamed like once Age of Empires 2 and mm-hmm. they had higher averages than you guys damn it Ah, damn it. Uh, the average viewership for the whole category went from uh, 2,350 in October mm-hmm. to 3,700 in November. Mm. So a pretty huge spike well, at 50%. October was Warlords as well, right? Or was no, Warlords, Warlords in November. November. Okay, okay, okay. November. Yeah, that helps too, yeah, of course. Of course yeah. So a big tournament. What, what tournament was it? Now I'm forgetting. Uh, Titans League, maybe? Titans League in October? I honestly don't remember. Man, are we forgetting like a... So ma- many tournaments. Are we forgetting major- <laughs> What was it before? Uh, it should be Titans League. It was League. Titans League, right? So, yeah, yeah, it was Titans League. If it yeah. wasn't, let's cut this part out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my question would be, it's pretty obvious. There are a lot of people only tune in to Twitch to watch you and to watch T90. Mm. And I was wondering, who are these people? I mean, where were they all this time? <laughs> Do you think these are just YouTube viewers that refuse to follow you to Facebook but are now okay with following you to Twitch? Or uh, I mean, I know, these I, people? I know there's a lot of people that didn't want to watch us on Facebook for reasons. Um... First of all, obviously, they didn't like the pl- Facebook platform. They didn't like the, what Facebook stood for, or what they have done, blah, blah, blah. So I, I think those people are like also like people that were our fans individually. Like they were, watch- they were watching our streams, not Age of Empires per se, right? Of course, Age of mm-hmm. Empires is a big part of our streams, but they mm-hmm. enjoyed watching me or T90. So I think those viewers didn't necessarily spread out to like everyone else, right? Um, so I think a lot of viewers are just like, yeah, maybe they've just been satisfied with YouTube for the last two years, right? And then, mm-hmm. oh, they're back on Twitch, let's go watch again, right? So there's a big chance that happened as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't see where else they will be coming from, right? It's not like suddenly we have uh, tons of random new people arriving, right? Yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive. I mean, the first streams, I was expecting it to be a lot of, a lot of people tuning mm. in, you know, the two guys. They, even if they didn't know you, they hear about you guys. Mm. Uh, but then you guys kind of kept the level. Uh, I mean, not not as high as the first streams, I think, but you kind of kept the level. So there was yeah. like, no, these are people who know who you guys are. 
and they've missed you and then they're going to stick around for the whole time and they yeah. just don't care about anybody else i thought that was a i mean both me and Tenali have a, a lot of follower counts on both youtube and right. twitch uh, twitter or x or whatever right so <laughs> When we spread the word, I'm sure a lot of All those people are trickling in as well that weren't watching us actively even before, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think it's just a summary of all things. Oh, that helps. Okay, so this is obviously way too early to make any definitive conclusion conclusions about the positive or negative effects mm -hmm. uh, of you guys' return to Twitch. But I was talking to Harrod just the other day, and he told me that as far as he can see, a lot of folks are not really increasing their metrics since you guys returned. Again, way too early to tell. Mm. But one thing he did point out was that both you and T90 usually host and raid smaller streamers yeah. and casual streamers, which, you know, is an admirable thing to do. But uh, it doesn't really help those mid-sized folks who are maybe trying to go full time and mm. are grinding every day. And as much as I'd like to make a drama moment out of this, <laughs> uh, he was incredibly, uh, it was just making an observation and he was, wasn't critiquing you whatsoever. No. Uh, so he, he had and no harsh words for you, obviously. So what do you make of that? Well, yeah, I mean, what, what made me happy, first of all, was like when there were tournament games, for example, both Memb and Dave, for example, like it doesn't look like they took a big hit from T90 casting suddenly, right? So I'm not sure exactly like how much it has been, but I think both Memb and Dave have both been happy with their viewership despite T90 being back and... Okay, there's a, there's something to that. I don't know if you saw the video from Memb. Um, mm -hmm. He made a video, like sort of a conclusion of Warlords 2. And T90... So he said he was happy with the viewership in general. So mm -hmm. there were 40,000 viewers. I think we're going to bring it bring it up later. But he said he wasn't happy about the viewership in his own channel. And I, he wasn't too direct about this. But what I think he was saying is that he was expecting or hoping yeah. to have the highest viewership of all the channels. And that was not the case. T90 had, had more viewers yeah. than he had. That's fair. Because like on Mem's events, he has had the highest viewership the last two years, right? Right. So it makes sense. He was hoping that probably would continue, which, I mean, does make sense, right? That he would like that. Of um, course. Yeah, obviously, there you would expect T90 still, if he's casting a major tournament, that he will still get the highest viewership, right? But like I said, I, I think if you compare this to before T90 went to Facebook, Mem's viewship usually was way lower compared to T90 during, for example, a final or a big event that Mem was hosting. But now Mem still had a significant amount of viewers. So mm -hmm. like in that regard, I think the return has not been a very big hit to for example, Memp in this case as a caster, right? Or Dave or whoever else is casting. Like, I think that's uh, that's a positive thing that that hasn't pushed them down, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, about what you said earlier with the, like, yeah, like I like to host smaller streamers just to like, I like to spread my host, right? I don't want to host the same person over and over again, right? For, but nowadays, for example, I'm hosting Nilly a little bit more when I have the chance because NEC. I want to help him push NAC and the incentives, right? And I'll do that as well in the future with others as well. But yeah, I, I like to spread my host to lower people. To try and like if I see someone with a fun title or looks like they're having a good time and with a webcam, for example, right? Eh, let's <laughs> throw them a host, right? Um, there's other, like I, I wouldn't host T90, for example, right? I mean, no offense to T90, <laughs> but he doesn't need it, right? Uh, of course, if there's warlords, if if Dave is hosting something, I will host them as well, right? But yeah, I like to host uh, lower viewers to give them a chance to have a jump and like grab an audience, right? Maybe like if they get 50 followers. Maybe 20 of them will return at some point and like give them another viewer boost, right? But on the mid-sized streamers, like I, I guess he's talking, what, 100, 200 viewers, streamers or so? I would assume he means something like, and I, I, I don't know if this is fair to call it mid-sized, but I assume he's talking about MBL, Hard, okay. these people that would like to make it full-time. Yeah, but I've been hosting both of them as well. So I'm not sure in that case. Okay, so maybe he feels like you need to do it more often. I know it's something but that that's I, the thing. you only have one host per stream. You cannot host that many people, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing I think it's funny on the internet and in general, actually, is that it's never enough to talk about one thing once or twice mm -hmm. or five times. You need to say it 1000 times <laughs> until people actually understand yeah. what you're trying to say. And I feel similarly about hosting, or at least I assume Hera feels similarly about hosting, that it's not enough to host once. Mm -hmm. You need to do it all the time. Now, I, I understand totally what you're doing. I mean, you want to spread the love. You, yeah. you, don't want, you don't want to keep it to a short amount of people. I do get that. But like, if I, I, I'm sure I will host MBL and Heart again, right? But at some point, it's like, is another host for me after like being hosted five times? Is this sixth host going to change the world for them? True. Also, probably not, right? And again, so it's way too early. I, yeah, I think it it's way just too way yeah, too yeah. early. To it's, it's, it's a topic that's worth revisiting in the future right, to see how much Absolutely. we can help as well as, in quotes, larger streamers too. I think Harris' thing here, and he's talked about this for many years now. I remember he talked about this many years ago, 
is he wants to see more cooperation between the big streamers. He always feels like there's a not not enough cooperation between the whale, but, as he calls it. But what kind of cooperation <laughs> well, is I he thinking about? Well, I guess stuff like his 2v5 videos, for example, ah, or maybe you guys cooperating on daily stream. Just content, content yeah, together. Content together. Oh, that's exactly, a different thing. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The issue with content together is it has to be scheduled ahead of time as well. Like, it's a lot of time investment because everyone has their own lives. And, you know. and I feel like you streamers especially are terrible at scheduling. Either. Really? I feel like YouTubers are a lot better at that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, for example, Spirit of the Law is someone that I would wish would cooperate a lot more mm -hmm. with our part of the scene. I mean, I think he's very much on the other <laughs> part the of the other scene, side. I would say. <laughs> uh, you know, the more cat, which is totally fine, yeah. obviously. But that's someone what I would wish uh, would he, cooperate he, a lot more with you guys. He has done a, a couple of A couple, for sure, yeah. for sure, for sure. I did for one sure. as well with him. It was just, he messaged me like, hey, Viper, do you want to, I'm doing this video, do you want to join? He was like, yeah. And we just did it in like a couple of days. It was uh, very we, easy uh, and straightforward. I remember, I remember, it was not that long ago. It was about the Aztecs. Aztecs, the, yeah, the yeah. Aztecs. Yeah. Uh, we did have... Uh, Spoiler: We did contact Spirit of the Law a couple of, a couple of months ago, and he didn't turn off. A, he didn't close the door. He showed no. openness to be on the show, so maybe you might see him here at some point. Yeah, let's move on uh, to mm -hmm. NAC Five and Nilly, mm -hmm. uh, it, because it seems like these days Twitch is sort of a revolving door, you know, of streamers coming and going. <laughs> yeah. So as both you and T90 were announcing your return to Twitch, Nilly announced his departure from full time streaming. He said you won't be completely gone from the scene and you just said it yourself. Mm. You never know. You can never be fully gone from Age of Empires 2. But he'll heavily reduce his time spent on Age of Empires. And he announced this at the same time he announced NEC 5, which made the whole thing a very bittersweet moment the for The last me. NEC 5. The last NEC 5, indeed. Um, I mean, I wanted to be fully and completely hyped for NEC, but it just wasn't possible. So, yeah, first of all, what's your reaction to Neely's announcement? Obviously, Neil's announcement, announcement is not a surprise to me, being his teammate and right. friend. He has obviously talked about this in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, he shared it actually fairly early on this year that uh, he was this really? was going to be yeah that this was going to be his last attempt as like a pro uh, not pro but like playing competitively right. No, yeah, he did say that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was always planning to like step down from competitive play after this year, unless he had like a, oh suddenly he wins uh, warlords or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I think. He has been grinding really hard. Like this guy with his schedule, right? He show, I saw his calendar once. It was like five different opponents scheduled set on the same day. So he like from 10 to 12, he's playing against this guy. Then from one to three, he's playing this guy. And like, that's his whole calendar for like a month. Mm -hmm. So the amount of grind he's putting in is insane. Um, yeah, but it's obviously a bit sad, right? Being like, he's been on our team now for many, many years. And he was also a good friend of mine, right? So it's a bit sad. Um, but yeah, like I always, Nilly will still continue streaming. He will still continue whole, casting tournaments. The thing is, from this point forward, he will do it on his terms, right? He won't feel the pressure of, okay, there's a tournament to qualify now. Ah, I need to cast it, right? Um, so yeah, I think he will be probably a little bit less active for sure, less daily streams, but he will do them way more conveniently for himself, right? Um, who knows? Maybe he will continue full time live streaming, right? Maybe NEC will spark the passion once again. Mm -hmm. Uh, you never know, right? If he finds uh, another job that he wants to pursue, and just do it like part time and this and that. Like, I think also like Age of Empires is quite time consuming. <laughs> so I think for his own personal life as well and his partner, uh, it's probably a little bit good for them that uh, they get a bit of a break as well from Age of Empires. But yeah, first impression was still sadness. But obviously, I'm happy for if it's going to be better for his life. That's I'm happy for him, right? For sure. Um, to be fair, he told me this many years ago. He never thought he would be able to continue streaming Age of Empires for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think it was pretty clear for him in his mind that at some point this is going to be over for him. And that's fine, too. Mm. So, again, well, just say if he's happy with this decision, I'm the, happy for him. For sure. I really wonder how much impact the whole AV4 switch I, had on his I was channel. just about uh, to break that because, in my opinion... Mm -hmm. um, this is just a feeling and I have no numbers for this for sure but I do have the feeling that he was one of the guys who never really recovered from all the bad mm. press uh, that he got from Age of Empires 4 and especially I think the worst thing was when he made AN4C and Force Age C, of Empires yeah. I feel like a lot of people have not forgiven him for that they may f have felt a betrayal and it's interesting that he feel the same thing too and uh, let me just uh, for folks who weren't here or just need their memories refreshed so when Age of Empires 4 came out nearly just like virtually every other content creator mm -hmm. switched uh, his focus entirely to AOE 4. Yeah. But in the case of Nilly, 
not only did he move to NA Wave 4, but he also made the first NAC after the pandemic yeah. and Age of Empires 4 tournament. And to make matters worse, at the time, he was the tournament coordinator of the franchise. Mm. So a lot of people felt like he was betraying the scene and backstabbing Age of Empires 2. Now, I think if you had all the information and you knew all the details of why he made his decisions... No one would... The hate he got was, yeah. in my opinion, massively unjustified. For sure. Uh, I, I feel someone who did so much for the community like he did um, should, have, should have been given a bit more of the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. But having said that, I think he played a small role in the hate that he got. And that's largely because of how he communicates his decisions. I felt He's German, like, man. <laughs> right. But even <laughs> then, I felt like there was very little empathy and yeah. very little understanding from Neely's part towards all the people who questioned him and were mm -hmm. like, hey, why are you doing this? You know, people who felt betrayed. Neely was very quick to shut off the criticism and say, well, I thought about this. I know this is the right way to go. Mm. Boom. But that, like, that's what Neil is, right? He's just very direct and very honest. And like, this is what he felt like was the right thing to try. And he went for it, right? And you can't blame him for that, right? I just wish, and I, I'm not even know. You wish he was it. more human. No, I wish he. I was gonna say, I wish he was a little bit more like Tristan, maybe, who probably goes to the other extreme uh, and to <laughs> tries to over over explain, explain why. And it is may, the guy. May, maybe I don't yeah, know. I mean, yeah. Everyone is how they are, but yeah. uh, maybe it's a bit too emotional sometimes. I can see that. I wish he would just be a little bit more empathetic because mm -hmm. these were people who were his fans yeah. and people who cared about the game. And sometimes it was just, maybe it didn't play a role whatsoever. I don't know. That, but uh, That's uh, something we can maybe ask him if he's ever back on the show, mm -hmm. right? And talk about it. Because, I mean, like, yeah, I felt like his viewership was pretty good before. I mean, he also committed a lot of time playing it before, right? So mm -hmm. it was a solid time of playing it before and then N4C. So maybe that time away from AO2 also just people got turned off from the idea of watching and playing AO2 again, right? Who knows? Yeah, that's maybe another thing that it's interesting because he focused a lot on playing Age Yeah, of, to Age learn so he was going to be a better caster and so forth, right? So it was not only the N4C, it was also his stream was AV4 for a while, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, there's a whole story there that we could dive deeper mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. with, with Nilly in person probably it would be better to see what he thinks himself. Yeah. But he has all the analytics, right? And knows how his viewership changed. I felt like his viewership were, was way bigger before he did that AV4 period. And then when he came back to AO2 again, it felt like it, he had taken a serious To hit. me, I think the thing is Mem and him were very close mm -hmm. in terms of viewership and even subscribers. And then once the whole AOE 4 thing started, mm. it just Mem just sort of exploded and he just stayed a little bit behind. That's that's my memory of the whole yeah. thing. It would be interesting to see some numbers. Uh, in any case, I think it's pretty hard to overstate what an impact Nili has had in the community, uh, mm. especially in the uh, competitive community. Dude, you go back, all the like ever since I started playing, Nili was involved, right, in tournament organizing this and that. I actually saw a clip the other day. Uh, Tiram has made a video like has the goat fallen off the throne. Yeah, yeah, very I've cringe. But uh, one of the first <laughs> pictures were like uh, uh, interview we did in Maldives, two thousand and fifteen. Oh, that would include me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you were you were there. Nearly was nearly was sitting there with his glasses. And he looked so different. Different, from, yeah. young. We and all then, looked so young. Yeah, we did. Oh. It was me, Jordan, and Yo. But yeah, like that's how far back Nearly, like even before that, he was involved, right? So Nearly has been there since the origin origination of Age of mm -hmm. Empires too, right? So people, yeah, don't. I, I think that goes to say for every organizer and people that are involved, like yourself, Taf, mm -hmm. all these guys that have done so much before many years ago. The credit that these people are not getting is. Also that they don't give a little, yeah, like you said, benefit of the doubt, right? Give them a little bit of a leeway bit, yeah. and they deserve so much credit for what they've done for the scene. Uh, speaking about Tiramis and his video, he did send it to me before he published because he wanted my feedback. I oh. didn't say anything because I love the video, uh, but he, <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to reveal this, uh, but he said he, he planned to, uh, to publish the video on your birthday, which is coming on my birthday, soon, but he didn't want to give you <laughs> a present that it's called <laughs> that, uh, has the goat fallen off his throne. <laughs> That's maybe not a good birthday gift. <laughs> in any case, very, very nice video. We're going to be publishing yeah. it in the description box for sure. One thing that I find impressive about Neely, uh, when you think about what NEC is now, you think about what it was when it started. It's mm. such a big difference. I don't know. I think it takes a brilliant guy, but a kind of crazy brilliant guy to come up with the idea, hey, what about if we just invite all the players yeah. all over the world to my place and yeah. we just have a land tournament and then we broadcast the whole thing? <laughs> I remember where NEC started with the idea, like the first discussions. Was it? I, guess, I guess, it had to be a drunk talk. It's got to be what there was alcohol was involved. Well, yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> but we had a meetup, Age of Empires meetup in Brighton in two thousand and seven. Oh, I have a vague idea with Zero Empires. Yeah, Zero Empires was there, for example. And I think yeah, I think Brighton. Yeah, there. yeah, Brighton, rings yeah. a bell. It rings a bell. And uh, yeah, there nearly was just like. I think maybe me and Ta me and Taro was there, 
as well. Maybe Doubt was even, no, that was in London. Wait, uh, now I'm confused myself. But anyway, I remember Nilly vividly talking to me about like, hey, would you be interested in coming to my apartment and like playing a tournament there? <laughs> like, the, what's the pri- well, the price will be? Yeah, maybe like a thousand dollars, but like I'll, pay, like, I'll pay your stay and whatnot. But yeah, he already had that idea. Like, okay, let me get some pro players together in my apartment in Hamburg and put a tournament there. And that's like the fact that it has now become to, uh, to the point where like, okay, in the where we're recording right now this whole huge apartment is where the tournament is taking place now um i mean everything starts with a little crazy dream right and yeah and i feel like a lot of people don't pursue that dream right and mm-hmm. he just he just put in yeah. put in the work it just goes to work and he just makes yeah. it happen i mean it was a risky decision right because the costs are there he paid, for sure. paid it all by himself yeah. right even now nsc5 i think the total cost is like one hundred ninety thousand dollars right now a lot of that is out of his own pocket if, mm-hmm. if he doesn't get enough support and sponsors and whatnot so yeah it's um he's a crazy guy <laughs> and but yeah he's pulling, brilliant crazy i was calling him yeah crazy but brilliant yeah i agree and i think um back if we go back to the nec one i think he got the money back from the community the community much, yeah. ended up sponsoring the whole thing so we can only hope the same it's thing also is gonna happen all these tournaments and everyone are hosting right are also investments into their own channel right right the growth the long-term growth as well right uh, i think during nscs the amount of followers he's gotten through hosting nscs right it's crazy crazy and yeah. also like there's the short-term benefit of like subscriber count increasing right. significantly during events of course it does drop off afterwards but like there are some short-term benefits and potential long-term benefits by hosting events. I mean, not, not only NSC, this goes for every other tournament Every as well. tournament organizer, yeah. for sure. But but let's let's get back to more positive thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, the preparations yeah, for NSC... NSC is still a very positive <laughs> thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all yeah. super well, high. Well, that's yeah. why we're going to finish with that part. So the preparations for NAC 5 have mm-hmm. now kicked into high gear. And as we told you before, the finals of the first qualifier were will be played today. Yeah. Uh, so we're recording this on a Sunday morning. And Disaster GL weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and from the three Gamer Legion players who participated, unfortunately, only one has mm. made it so far to the final. And that was Tato, who will be playing Barrels. Doubt, once again, was this very guy. close to making it. But the curse, man, uh, the, the curse. He was leading 2-0. 2-0 against zero Heart. over Heart, yeah. Right, and then ended up losing 3-2. Did you watch the game? I, I was actually, yesterday I was with my cousins, like Toplo and another cousin from Norway. They're sitting over there. We went yesterday to League of Its Own, uh, League of Legends event here in Berlin. In the Berlin Velodrome. I right? saw s- something about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was with really Chalks f- hosting, right? Uh, v- yeah, for example. Uh, Faker was there as well. Like T1 with Faker uh, and a lot of other teams. I think Faker is like the Viper of League of Legends. Isn't it like like the guy yeah, let's, who's... Let's just call him the goat of League of Legends. Because uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm off the throne, you know? So it, uh, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, it was a real cool event. But yeah, I wasn't able to watch anything. Also, I didn't want to get spoiled by Manchester United results. So I didn't uh, okay, check okay, my okay. phone. So, so yeah, I didn't watch the games. But I, when I got back to the hotel and lay down in bed, I like started like... I actually came to the hotel when the fourth game was being played between mm-hmm. Doubt and Heart. So I watched the last two games. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Doubt again leading. Uh, like During Warlords, he was leading every set and he lost. And now he led a 2-0 event and lost 3-2. And then I checked Discord right after and he said he's cursed. He cannot <laughs> win the side games anymore. <laughs> so uh, he's the new Tato. Uh, All right. At some point, it was supposed yeah, to be Tato. Tato was 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 that. Well, he over. He did overcome it, so we can only hope that uh, yeah. doubt is the same at some point. And Jordan, he lost to Sebastian. And um, f- being completely honest here, it's a player I don't know much about. Mm-hmm. I know he's young, 21 years young, I think. Oh, is he 21? Yeah, 21, yeah. pretty young. And he's from uh, Uruguay. Uruguay, yeah. Right, so... Uh, he also beat uh, Freaking Andy as well, right? So uh, Right, in the round before. Sebastian mm-hmm. is on a solid run so far, and I think he has tomorrow... Is it maybe who played? Does he ACCM. Play ACCM. ACCM. ACCM yeah. Okay, that's mm-hmm. gonna be a tough one though. Let's see if we can overcome that one. But yeah, Sebastian has been on a run and looks like he has prepared well mm-hmm. and playing pretty well. So ACCM, he's been here last year, so he mm-hmm. obviously wants wants mm-hmm. to be here again. I um, think we also have like Sita and Hart is the only final, so we have a one guaranteed new player to an NAC. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that's correct. So the finals are Tato and Barles, uh, Sebastian S- and ACCM. Yeah. And then Cito, Cito and Hart. Hart. Interesting. You're right. One of them is going to be here for yeah. the first time. The, the I'm just thinking the next qualifier. How freaking stacked that's going to be. <laughs> the amount of players, the good players that have not re- even reached the finals for this weekend, is off the charts, man. And, and for Game of Legion, the problem is that both Jordan and Doubt might be on the same bracket now. I think I that's impossible. It's impossible. They're, they're both so high seeded. That okay. They're going to be top three seeds no matter what. So All they, right. They cannot be in the same bracket. We just hope that Tato will qualify now, right? So the chance is completely excluded because Tato is seed one right now. If he wins, I think Jordan and Doubt will be like seed one to three. But okay. if Tato loses, 
maybe there will be some changes in the seeding where suddenly Dauta Jordan is pushed to like fourth seed and mm-hmm. then they could face, right? And if not, we got Nili to ring the brackets yeah. if he has to. True. That's, <laughs> why, yeah, that's why he's here. Uh, another crazy upset yesterday, Dark against Vilesa. Dark right. 3-0. Yeah. 3-0. So I think Vilesa did pretty well in, in Warlords, but obviously I think he's been more busy with studies the right. last couple of months right, right, compared right. to before. So maybe that's starting to show. Like Viles, like Viles also will have to try and qualify next week. And right, NBL lost to Heart. The fact they met in round of twenty four is crazy. It's pretty crazy. With. Right, so, yeah. yeah, the amount of players. Yeah, next week is going to be hype. And I think it just shows how incredibly the competitive scene is right now, and how competitive the whole thing is. When Viles, someone, <laughs> I mean, beat you last. He wasn't he the one who eliminated you last. I, I'm so confused NAC? right now. NAC. No, I lost to uh, Lear in the semifinal. I beat I beat Vilesa in the quarterfinal. Yeah, he beat you some. Well, well he's he got a very good times, he's got a very yeah. good record against you. In any case, someone like that, if he stops playing for a couple of months or a couple of weeks, yeah, all of a sudden he can't qualify anymore, right? Uh-huh. So that's that's kind of crazy. Okay, so but you together with Hera, Liri, and Yo were directly invited to the mm-hmm. event, so you won't be playing the qualifiers. Yeah. Have you officially started your preparation for the tournament, or are you just still relaxing for the time? I'm being? still relaxing, right? Yeah. I, I also had uh, obviously that we're going to talk about the cartographers, right? So I ran a two-week event there and yeah then uh, this week i went to berlin right the weekend here so yeah i mean i've offered my services to my teammates if you want me to train with you just let me know and i'll be there um but yeah, i haven't personally tra- started my own training right um i still want to probably take another week or two before i like intensify towards nac but as i said I told my teammates, if you want practice, just tell me, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I want to help them and try to see if I can help them qualify. For sure. Uh, there's always this question of whether playing a qualifier actually helps you. Mm. Uh, because if you were to play, the chances are you would very likely qualify anyway, but you'd get sort of a p- to play test the maps in real time, yeah, you yeah. know? Which in the case of NEC5 with like 21 maps might actually be an advantage. You get to apply or test strategies as well, right? To see, okay, mm-hmm. does this play style work? Does this still work, right? right? So you get to test that in, in actual games. So it's a bit different than training, right? Um, for me, it's always been like, a, I've been invited to a lot of events through my years. And I've, I've missed it a little bit because I get to see people play these weekends. Right? I, I'm competitive, right? I want to play a you tournament. Play it, so right? yeah. so like, sometimes I sit there on the sidelines and watch them play qualifiers and I'm like, I wish I was playing, right? <laughs> but obviously it is more comfortable to be invited. Um, I'm sure most people would choose to be invited, but also you miss that. You get a little bit of an itch playing, right? When you see So it could up. be helpful. Yeah, 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 it could definitely be helpful on preparation and training, right? Because then you also have to pre- prepare for a qualifier, right? But um, only if the maps stay the same from qualifiers to main event, right? Mm-hmm. We've had some situations where qualifier map pools switches a little bit to the main event. And then it's like, okay, I put in hours and hours to train this map and suddenly it's not played anymore, right? Mm-hmm. I, I would still prefer to be invited, but yeah, for could, sure. Could help. <laughs> okay, then I just like to remind people: Nelly has set up a donation link mm-hmm. with rewards for NAC Five. Uh, the tournament will happen either way, uh, yeah. and Microsoft is sponsoring it with one hundred thousand uh, dollars. But in a land like this, where you have uh, players and casters flying from, flying from all over the mm-hmm. world, there are obviously a lot of extra costs associated with the event. They are not covered by yeah. Microsoft. So if you'd like to help Nelly. Uh, check out the donation link that we're going to be putting. A small donation of twenty thousand dollars can let you choose a map pool, a map in the tournament. <laughs> Only twenty thousand dollars. Only twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> what a deal, bro! And you can get Rage Force in there. <laughs> let's go, Rage Force community. Let's, <laughs> right, right, right. let's get together. <laughs> get together. Okay, so in the month of November, we had Warlords two running from the first mm-hmm. to the nineteenth. And we already talked about Viper's run and the tournament in general in our Warlords 2 post-match talk video, Mm -hmm. uh, which you can find on this channel. But one thing I'd like to say about Warlords 2, and I'd like to hear your opinion on it, is that in my mind, it is now a more interesting tournament to watch than King of the Desert. For sure. Uh, Right? Right? And I I don't say this lightly because, you know, King of the Desert has historically been a very important tournament for the scene. I think King of the Desert 2 was the first tournament to actually include the new civs Mm -hmm. uh, on Boobly, so for HD edition using the Wall of Kingdoms patch. But I, I think Civ Balance, Civ Variety, and map scripting are now at such a high level uh, that I think single map tournaments are probably going to end up becoming stale. Yeah. Maybe besides like Arena, for example, right? Because Arena is still yeah. different. But it, a lot of people find that well, stale as well, well too. Well, fair. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I agree. Like King, their minds. Well, King of the Desert has, is like a classic at this point, right? It is still only Arabia, right? And also, there's the RNG of when do you choose certain civs, right? And you get an unfortunate matchup, right? While for these mixed maps, Warlords, uh, whatever, NSE now as well, you can prepare kind of like 
two, three sieves on the map, right? And it's not going to be like, oh, oh, randomly I ran into this sieve on this map instead of that, right? Because you always can kind of predict and plan out how the map will likely play out, right? So there's a lot more, less RNG in some mm -hmm. ways in sieve picks and preparation. Well, in King of the Desert, it's also like, besides being the same map all over again, it's also the sieve RNG that can be a bit frustrating for players. Right, so, right, right. Uh, but I agree, yeah, like the enjoyment from a strategic and entertainment aspect, I think is way larger with mixed maps compared mm -hmm. to single maps. So I'm not sure, maybe King of the Desert has lived out its... Uh, its purpose. Uh, purpose, yeah. And now it might, it might make more sense to have Warlords 3 rather than King of the Desert 6. Mm -hmm. Would it be now? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Mem is considering that as well because mm. the viewership was pretty similar to uh, King of the Desert Five. As I think forty thousand live viewers, mm -hmm. uh, though King of the Desert had a eighty thousand dollar prize pool. Right. We almost forget such a high number. Was it that high? A eighty thousand dollar prize pool as opposed to the fifty thousand from Warlords mm -hmm. too. But on the other hand, you had T90 and Viper back on Twitch, which might have given the viewership a bit of a boost. So, so you never know. In any case, uh, then we had the cartographers two v two tournament organized. What and an amazing won, tournament. And won by you together with your teammate and friend Jordan. Mm. Uh, a couple of months ago, you had told me it would be an open classic. You would be organizing an open classic. So when you said it was a guitar, you said, what? Yeah. <laughs> what uh, caused the change? Uh, initially, I was supposed to do a one-on-one -one tournament, right? But like we have so many one-on-one -on -one tournaments, right? Yeah. And also my time window got shrinked from three weeks to two weeks oh. in terms of like how long the event can be. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, okay, what do we not have these days that we have had a lot of before, right? Like, no, that we haven't had in a long time, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we've had a little bit of 3v3, not too much 4v4, but one ones we have all the time, right? So like, hmm, I remember I really liked playing the like 2v2 World Cups, for example, and things like that. So why don't we just try and throw together a 2v2 tournament with fun maps and like a fun uh, style draft? Like obviously took inspiration from the Warlords in the category. With the category thing. Categories, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, we just, uh, we, together with T-West, we kind of figured out how like can we change certain maps and make them more interesting for 2v2 like outcrop for example it was my idea that we put like okay why don't, why don't we turn this into like i think the other map is called sunburn where you have like tcs in front of each other instead of like normally you have like them parallel against each other mm -hmm. but i just put like okay we have like a pocket kind of on outcrop where you have to expand to the sides so i thought it made an interesting dynamic of the map right so yeah, we just wanted to have a 2v2 tournament with a lot of interesting maps and the draft and whatnot. And you see a lot of fun teams as well come together, like ACCM Slam. Like, that's a team you didn't expect to show up, right? <laughs> and they showed up to play as well. So, yeah, the the whole going from 1v1 to 2v2, I think, was the correct decision as well. Mm -hmm. And I, like, I'm super happy with how it went. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you guys won the whole thing. Besides that, I'm still <laughs> and, super happy. Uh, just as we did with Warlords 2, we also had a post-match mm. talk about the cartographers. Uh, we talked about the games, about yours and Jordan's performances. And uh, so if you're interested, make sure to check that video. You can also find it in this channel. But today I'd like to hear more about your perspective as a tournament host mm -hmm. and even as a caster, because oh. you did cast a lot of games. I did indeed. Uh, so was it, a lot of, was it a lot of work? Or? Uh, preparation obviously took some time. It was like when I was preparing to come back to Twitch, half of the preparation was also like preparing the tournament, right? Because it was going to be announced the same day as I came back on Twitch, right? right? So yeah, uh, a lot of hours went into the preparation for sure. But the uh, thing that I was very adamant on this tournament compared to Open Classic was I'm going to take a little bit of pressure off myself during the tournament. Mm. Like, I'm not going to feel pressure to stream everything or cover every round or this and that. So I only started properly covering it from like round of 16 onwards, the best matches there. And then obviously I covered the semifinals and whatever happened. In the end, uh, it's still the prize pool of the tournament was still not big enough that, okay, me and Jordan, if we get fourth place instead of second or top eight instead of top four it's not the end of the world price pool wise but obviously me and jordan had ambitious to do well anyway mm -hmm. but yeah as a tournament host uh, yeah a lot of hours into work but as the tournament started it was like okay regarding admin decisions and running the tournament all that was off me right because also conflict of interest right right i don't want to have any admin power over uh, decisions that could impact teams and players of my opponents so um, once the tournament started it was more like okay now i only have to worry about my streaming part of the tournament no, not running the tournament itself. So that was definitely nice. While well, during the um, Open Classic back in the day, I mean, still didn't have any power in terms of admin decisions mm -hmm. back then, but I still kept up with everything and like tried to cover everything. And um, that was only a weekend tournament though. But yeah, I definitely felt how that impacted my play. Obviously, it impacted me this time as well because we had the situation where me and Jordan had to get up at 5.30 a.m. to play games. Yeah. And then I still had to cover some fans later that day. Who was play. that against? Uh, yeah, so we Jordan had a work thing on Friday where he had to travel to another city and like he wouldn't be home until like 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. And then we were, opponents were slamming ACCM. Ugh. 
9 p.m. Our one time. guy is in Canada, one exactly. guy is in it's Vietnam. It's like the worst <laughs> possible situation. <laughs> so the only conclusion was either we have to give like an admin win, and that would be kind of embarrassing to give an admin win in my that own tournament, <laughs> <laughs> or we play like 5 a.m., uh, 6 a.m. our time. For uh, Jordan, Jordan was like, yeah, no let's problem. go. <laughs> I've been awake for four hours. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, but for me, it was it was brutal, man. Uh, I went to bed around two because I didn't get tired until then. And mm-hmm. then I struggled to sleep. So I probably fell asleep around three and then had to get up around five. It was brutal. And then we did set took like three and a half hours, went to do the cider game, which was crazy. True. And then I tried to get some sleep again. I think I managed one more hour of sleep and then I had to get up to start my stream again start for the training. semifinals. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. It was a brutal day, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and then we played like past midnight, the, la- the semifinals against Tato and Doubt, and we were able to win. So that, was they, like, uh, that series also went to the fifth game. Yeah, so uh, it yeah, was another long To the series. seventh game, uh, actually. Was it a seventh? Seventh was, was best of seven. seven okay. yeah. It was a crazy day. Uh, oh. <laughs> we jumped away now a little bit from tournament organizing. But yeah, as a tournament organizer, I'm still very happy with the event as well, viewership. I think especially the results and the outcomes of the games, right? There were so many decided games yeah, uh, yeah. throughout the tournament. And I also think the maps, map pool was a big success. So mm-hmm. I'm very happy with it. And yeah, I would not be opposed to doing a second edition at some point. Cool. Uh, what about Open Classics? That can make it come back to? <sighs> open Classic was more of a like three villagers start, classic maps. And I feel like we're not there at the moment. Okay. Uh, we, we had the Clash of Titans tournament now, the promo where we played like the classic maps and class- classic sieves and like yeah. <laughs> it's not what it used to be right it's a nice throwback to like how it used to be but at the same time the game is in a different state yeah, right it's now. one of the things I hear a lot of people especially older guys like us who look oh back then we have mm-hmm. this I think it's so much better the way it is today I, for I, sure I have no I have nostalgia about where we are now for sure yeah but in terms of how the game was, zero nostalgia to how it was back then. Yeah, like Galley Wars personally. on the islands. I don't think we're there at the moment. <laughs> and Vikings <But> only. <laughs> yeah, Vikings only. No, I think Open Classic, uh, I wouldn't rule it out that uh, if, if the stars align that it might do it again, but it will be very different, I think. It would be, again, just a weekend event, and but with more modern settings, so to say, if I did it again. But then again, that kind of steps away from the concept it started off as. So huh, we have enough of only one tournament. I don't Let's think see. Open Classic is... Let's see. Needed. Okay, cool. So then I'd still like to quickly talk about our custom map challenge. Mm-hmm. I think it's fair to say November's edition was a major success. Uh, yeah. A lot of people tried the map. A lot of people streamed their runs, right? So yeah. I, I think all in all was really fun and was really great to see people getting um, mm. uh, so hyped up about the whole thing. I did a bit of an oopsie there. I was like, I was going to meme a bit for content. So I wrote to... <laughs> To the guys in charge, like, oh, Tato, he, he moved units while well paused. I was going to make, like, a video about it, how, like, Tato was cheating. So now I'm going to take the oh, record. But then he was actually disqualified. <laughs> yeah, he was disqualified because you were not allowed to do that. So I started feeling so bad. What a snitch, man. And I tried to make them, like, allow, just, it's fine. No, it doesn't make a difference, right? Just allow it. But obviously, if they allow that, it's like, oh, GL, preferential treatment. Right, right, right. right. They could so, do that. So Tato got wrecked. First, I wrecked him by telling him that he couldn't play on fast speed, which he did. So that was also not allowed. So I kind Though of, I wonder, it's actually harder, right? If you play and fast speed it's potentially but it could mess with the spawning of units and, ah, and how they behave yeah, true, so true, true, everyone true. should play on the same terms, true true right? true, true for sure. yeah i, I kind of wrecked tato twice <laughs> and then tato took like a sick time of like 55 minutes or so or maybe even like one hour and two minutes or so i actually don't remember but yeah even he only made top three in the end uh, because freaking guy. andy again uh, took the whole thing home uh, and see how that played out he didn't do great in warlords didn't do great in uh, uh, well, we, know why. we know why now he's been grinding <laughs> yeah, a <laughs> map challenge yeah. too much <laughs> map challenge for priorities man <laughs> i mean who cares about nsc if you can get your name on a hero in the custom right? map challenge right? right okay so in december we're also going to have the last patch of the year uh, there are some interesting quality of life improvements like uh you can now lock gates before they're actually built mm. feels like it should have been the game years yeah. ago uh, the amount of times you finish the game <laughs> gate and they open it immediately Oof. yeah my quick walls will now be perfect <laughs> uh deer behavior is now supposedly mm. a bit more consistent mm, that one is exciting uh there especially for newer players i feel like yeah uh, there's now an option in the ui that shows you more unit stats like movement speed minimum range reload time uh, before you had to go to third-party software uh, sites you to know, check that. Sorry, I just have to, like I'm thinking about now how the new and improved their pathing is going to play out. <laughs> I can see them running all over the place. Well, guess what? There are apparently <laughs> pathing improvements coming what? with this. 
<laughs> I guess I've heard up, that uh, one before. I, I guess it's up to the viewer to decide how much stock they want to put into that. But uh, uh, although they were a bit more specific this time around, oh, okay. so they said the changes to the pathfinding. Okay, so, so they fixed the regrouping thing, which was indeed very obviously not yeah, working. I've been complaining know, about that for like two years at this point. The no, but isn't logic. it a new thing with this patch? I felt like it was worse with this patch. Logic has always been a big problem. I mean, I, I've been talking about it to them for a long time. Where I've told them like. It doesn't make sense that the units on the front go five steps back to group up with another unit all the way from the back. Unless we're talking about a different type of... No, no, we're and, talking exactly about yeah. that. But I feel like it's a thing that it's been introduced with this patch. No, and it I've, had it, I've had it for a long time. So yeah. maybe it wasn't the... It wasn't all, all the time. It just no, obviously not all the time. But okay, like, but this time, in, with this patch, it was happening all the time. And okay. a lot of people are complaining maybe about it. Maybe it's worse now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be. Th that would be my surprise. Again, <laughs> again uh, how much stock you were to put into how much they've yeah. improved it, it's up to you. I mean, I, I just want to say, I, I meme a lot about the devs now. New and improved path thing. It's, like, it's become a meme in itself. But uh, I still think the devs do an amazing job. But Me too. Every, like, everything else is really, like I love the balance at the moment. I know the, love the new Civ designs. Uh, in general, all the balance changes they are making are pretty solid. But yeah, the pathing issues the last couple of months in particular has been quite brutal. So let's hope they can get on top of that. And it's important to say that I, I believe all developers I've listened to and read talking about pathing, it's one of the most complicated yeah. things. And we need to know as well that uh, devs are working with very old code, very old yeah. engine as well. So I assume, I mean, I guess I would never jump to the first conclusion that they are just not competent. Yeah. That would never be my first conclusion. And I, I'm... I don't like when people do that. Yeah. The, their first conclusion, well, doesn't work. It's got to be bad. You know, I, I would always look for other explanations, especially if you considered all the work, all the mm. amazing work that they've otherwise done, right? Uh, yeah, right. But I think the big headline, <laughs> apart from the pathfinding <laughs> improvements, is the monk changes. Uh, right. And I, I, I personally think they're excellent. Mm -hmm. I know they don't go as far as some people would like to, Hera specifically, but I think they did a good job. He wants job. more changes than this? I think he wants more, um, Damn. yeah, bigger changes than I that. I feel like they're doing quite dramatic changes already. Right. Uh, I think they did a fine job of threading the needle, the very fine needle of making it less viable for pro players, mm. but not nerfing it to the point where newer players just have no chance of using them and it becomes useless to them. And again, just to let people know what exactly they did. So um, I don't want to get too technical here, uh, but what they did is they made it so that 80% of conversions now happen between five and seven seconds. So that they've shortened... So they've shortened the maximum range and the minimum range. So it's a bit more consistent in Correct. the mid range of normal So 80% conversions. of conversions would be happening between five and seven seconds. Uh, so there's still RNG involved, yeah. but it's a little bit more consistent. And they also split the faith technology into two. Mm -hmm. so so Faith is a very expensive Imperial Age upgrade that gives units conversion resistance. And now they've added a new technology to the monastery called Devotion, mm. which is already available in Castle Age, but has a smaller effect on units. Yeah. It's a fairly cheap technology, and it's available to all Civ. So how do you feel about that? I think changes? it increases conversion time by one second. One. One, yeah, one. Yeah. So one minimum, one maximum. It pushes the minimum one second further. Yeah. Correct. Um, I think it's a good change. I mean, like, yeah, cons they are, they're making two changes here, right? Uh, very impactful changes, right? They're giving a, a tech. I imagine all civs will have this tech. I the devotion, every, every, every civ, civ yeah. has got But not every civ tech. has faith the follow Correct. up. So, okay. But to be fair, only like three or four civs don't have faith. Yeah, uh, yeah. Most of them have faith. And they have also already, like in the previous patch, pushed the fact that monks no longer idle villagers consistently when you're spam clicking it, like when they're trying to build a castle, for example. No charging up of conversion And you cannot on charge on buildings and then switch it to a unit and get an instant conversion. So there's been a lot of significant changes to monks where they cannot be abused as much as in the past, I would say. Uh, so I think, yeah, I'm actually surprised on how many changes we've gotten even, right? Okay. Um, but yeah, maybe this will make monks less play. Maybe it will push more back, a little bit more knight play rather than light cap play. Um, I am happy that they're making changes to monks. I'm a little bit scared for the clown feedback because I, I know that we have the clowns in the Discord as well, where they're with the devs, right? Where they're discussing and arguing their side of the cases. Um, yeah, they also have changed in the overall cost of faith in the end will be smaller, it's gonna be cheaper, cheaper it's gonna as be well. Cheaper, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're, they're making significant changes to the monks and yeah, I just hope it's going to turn out good. Uh, I also think the monk meta has been too strong, but I'm not sure if they needed like, we have like four or five changes now over the last two patches. Maybe mm -hmm. that's too much, we'll see, but yeah, I'm, I, I still like the devotion tech. I think it's, it's a positive one to I give think people it's a, a good counterplay. Idea. Yeah. And something I've wondered, especially during Warlords 2, was that it doesn't... I do feel like there were more monks than usual, maybe mm -hmm. because this is just <laughs> catching on, I feel like. Uh, but 
doesn't that actually promote more diverse unit compositions? Because I, it did see a lot more light calves being played, for example. So doesn't it, at the end of the day, actually improve unit diversity and unit compositions? I'm not sure, because if you're if the other guy is making monks, you kind of have to make light cav, right? Yeah, oh. but then you mix it, because light cav alone are not a strong unit to raid or something like that. Well, you like make that. your own light cav and monk, right? So you convert his not light cav units, and you have your light cav units to snipe his monks. Uh, but like you, you see way less knights, way less camels, way less unique units because of the heavy monk play, right? So in my opinion, it doesn't necessarily promote diverse play. Um, but obviously, without if monks become completely out of the meta again, suddenly light cav are not going to be played anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to have mostly knights and crossbow unique units. And again, um, I mean, I guess it's just like, what do you prefer yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. All right. And then the last thing I'd like us to do before the interview is to sort of make a general assessment of the year 2023. Mm -hmm. And I'll start by just dropping a few facts and figures here. So the total prize pool for this year was $490,000. And that puts us behind 2022 and 2021, but ahead of 2020. Mm -hmm. And anything before those years just completely pales in yeah, comparison yeah. to that. Just to give you an idea, I think in 2019, which is the year DE was released, mm -hmm. uh, we had a total of $200,000. And DE was released at the end of the year. End of 2019, yeah. correct. Interestingly enough, there were more events, more total events organized this year than in 2022. Uh, so we had fewer S tier tournaments, a similar amount of A and B tier, but a lot more C tier tournaments. Right. Like over twice the amount that we had last year, which yeah. is pretty interesting, I, I feel like. Uh, then viewership wise, the average across the year was honestly pretty similar to 2022 mm -hmm. until November when yeah. it has returned <laughs> and the whole thing jumped by like 50%. We had smaller peaks than in 2022, mm -hmm. uh, but that was basically because we had no Red Bull and yeah. no Hidden Cup. That very important, and we don't talk about this enough, I feel like. We do, but <laughs> not anyone else. Uh, but we actually hit an all-time record of players this year. Sick. It's something that I've been told, that uh, um, player, player base has been increasing year over year. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the single most important stat that Microsoft is. is looking at, yeah. right? The total number of people that are actually playing our game. Mm. So in general, I think this was a very good year for Age of Empires 2, if you take everything into account. And I think next year will be better. Considering the Dutch game, I think it's a pretty solid state. Dutch uh, game. <laughs> and what I'm also happy to see is that Age of Empires 4 looks to be doing pretty good and your player base They're as well. They're increasing a lot yeah. in player base. So it's True. a, yeah, again, Everyone that plays AW2, it's fine. AW4 doing good is also good for Age of Empires 2. So. It definitely is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, like I, I think on that, like you said, the amount of tournaments we have now, right? I think we might even have too many tournaments. Okay. Right? There, it, it's just such a thing as tournament fatigue as a viewer. People talk about that, but I'm not sure if there is because the biggest amount of tournaments you have, you're still giving people who don't know the game a chance to actually meet the game and yeah. no, learn about the game but like this time like especially this few last few months right i was involved in that right we have warlords like t90 titans league finished warlords begins warlords finishes we have the cartographers but you can cartographers just not watch finishes. you can just Anything. not watch yeah but it also tournament player part fatigue right okay we, have, um, we play a play. tournament oh the next tournament is already started by the time this is finished so like the preparation time is gone right and also as a streamer player myself i don't have time to just like shut out the tournament brain and like stream and just have fun right right uh, you're in a very particular situation yeah. of course as a so, top player and top streamer i think for most people more tournaments are, are not bad okay i think so i think players in general feel like there might be too many tournaments at the but moment. they can just not play they can but that feels wrong right <laughs> well just just do it be a grown-up you but, know but, <laughs> just be grown. <laughs> but maybe there's a, a a thing to be said about having maybe a little bit less big tournaments and then just like rather uh, increase the price pool of that to make more major events rather than all the. Uh, it feels weird calling a thirty thousand dollar medium event, right? right? No, no. But, but if you get what I mean, like, what let's have five, uh, six to seven, eighty thousand dollar tournaments instead of ten, twenty thousand dollar tournaments, mm -hmm. for example. Okay, uh, just to be clear, this year we had fewer S tier tournaments mm -hmm. than twenty twenty two. So that would also S tier uh, demands on the computer have changed. They keep though. changing. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. I was just just watching the resurgence, mm -hmm. which was, I think was that Jordan's tournament. I think resurgence it was Jordan's, was Jordan's yeah. and it was a ten thousand dollar tournament, and it was considered an S tier, -tier tournament. Yeah. And for example, your tournament was an A tier. Yeah, and for example, resurgence me Hera didn't play as well, right? I think there was another player as well. So. Yeah, the, the, the rules have definitely changed. The criteria changed, yeah. keep criteria changing. Keeps changing yeah. That's true, yeah. So do you have a favorite moment from this of year? this year? Favorite moment of this year? I'm trying to think what happened this year. <laughs> I don't remember. 
Um, maybe winning cartographers with Jordan. All right. Or return to to Twitch. Okay. Probably those two are like quite significant for me this year. Um, yeah, I mean, I was, now I was put on the spot to like think yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. the whole year. Well, I did tell you. This was coming. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Cartograph- cartographers was a good moment because I was able to win a tournament. Like first of all, play two v two with Jordan again was very like nostalgic because we played two v twos back in the day, right? And yeah, also some context as well to the like me and Jordan winning it. There's more context to it, but it was quite special for us. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I think that was probably the most like happy moment for me as well because i also felt the happiness from jordan winning the tournament you can right? tell you could tell yeah. you guys were really happy and we jordan were. as well <laughs> yeah jordan, yeah i think yeah, i think jordan played amazing as well so mm-hmm. absolutely mm-hmm. deserved it um yeah and of course on a personal streaming level going back to twitch was really enjoyable and mm-hmm. i'm happy for the future and yourself yeah so for me favorite tournament for sure nac4 for sure uh, was mm-hmm. it the only land we had this year yeah uh, it was the only land right yeah, I, think so. I, I think it's such an amazing vibe and it's so yeah. excited for number five uh, but uh, memory as a whole, for me, it's really, I think it's been the whole time that I've been spending hanging out over the Discord, the Rage, uh, Rage Forest Rage Discord Forest. server. <laughs> and I feel like I have to tell this story. So this is going to be the story of Savvy Empire. Do you know who Savvy I is? Know. Have you played, played some games with him? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Savvy is a 30-something American guy. He's got a job. He's married. He's got three kids. And he streams eight hours a day, mm. uh, sometimes more, sometimes Sick. less. And he does that by simply not sleeping. He just doesn't sleep. He, he sleeps like two to three hours a day. He streams on Twitch or he streams on the on Discord? Twitch. On okay. Twitch and Twitch. Uh, okay. uh, Twitch and Discord. Okay, so he shares his screen on Discord correct. and he's streaming on Twitch. Okay. Correct, correct. Okay. Um, and, you know, he's got a really good heart. Uh-huh. I like him a lot. He's a very nice guy, mm-hmm. really polite, but he's very stubborn. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and that has earned him a bit of a bad reputation, bad reputation within the server, because a lot of people have tried to coach him uh, and stuff like that. But he just tends to ignore advice. <laughs> he, <laughs> wait, he, he accepts coaching and then he ignores the advice. No, no, coaching is an in informal coaching, okay, not so official coaching. Yeah, but, yeah, suggestions, basically okay. people backseating him. Okay, okay people okay. join him, people start telling him what to do. There's one particular funny clip about him shouting to Sito's face. You have no clue what you're saying. To Sito? Oh, Sito was backseating him. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, just to be clear. Well, uh, I, I just also want to say, there's a big chance he's right. Okay, go on. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, Savvy is a 1400, or like he was at the time 1400, 1500. Uh, then in one, usually he's really good at just taking it all in and uh, doesn't care about it, but people make fun of him because mm-hmm. we all tend to make fun of him from time to time. <laughs> he's got a thick skin. And again, he's a really nice guy. Really, uh-huh. re- really good heart. But sometimes... <laughs> Things do boil over a little bit, and once I don't know how it all started, uh, but I think it was Keller was trying to coach him, and he might have ignored some of the advice well, as he should. <laughs> if it was Keller, I would as well. And then Keller just goes like, "Savvy, you'll never be able to make it to seventeen hundred. That's impossible." And Savvy goes like, "Oh yeah, you want to put some money on that?" Oh. And Keller, okay, let's make it one hundred dollars. You won't be able to make it to seventeen hundred by right. the end of the year. And then, um, and he accepted. Savvy accepted. And then once the other folks, the Discord server, heard about it, a yeah. lot of people wanted to join in on the band because yeah, yeah. no one believes he's going to be able to make it. So right <laughs> now, uh, it's I think our five people are betting uh, one hundred dollars against him. So five hundred total. On top of that, one of his viewers has said if Savvy makes it to seventeen hundred, he will donate five hundred dollars on top of that. Okay. So it's now a one thousand dollars. Is, is Savvy <laughs> betting against it that if he loses, he has to pay, or is it only like? No, he thinks he's gonna make it. Of course. Also, oh, he if he loses, he or like loses the bet, he has to pay a hundred dollars to them. Correct. Okay. okay. No, no, it's to each one of them. Yeah, that's what so I mean. So five hundred. Yeah. yeah. But he obviously, yeah, that's the one thing about Savvy. He's always so confident. How, what's it, his current elo? Okay, so here's the thing. Throughout the, I think this bet was made maybe February or mm-hmm. March. It was very early on in the year. Uh, so he. He had made barely any progress for most Ooh. of the year. Barely, and then he would get uh, frustrated. He would play Black Forest again, and they'll go back to uh, it's one a one v one bet in case, okay, back, okay. in case that wasn't clear. But then a few weeks ago, <laughs> he started slowly but surely making progress, Ooh. and I think his personal best is now sixteen sixty. So he's incredibly close to seventeen hundred. So if you guys wanna uh, wanna see what's going on and if Savvy's actually gonna be able to make it, tune in. To, I'm gonna shout out his. Uh, it's a channel that's uh, Twitch TV slash Savvy Empire. Uh, stream is mostly just me and others yeah. back city making fun of him. It's it, it's a really good time. I like I it think, a lot. I think I was actually tagged in the Discord as well when this bet uh, occurred. Uh, like people, how oh, do I hyper coach him? You know, I think so. 
Sabe, if you if you want, we can go. Like, well, make something happen. well, the thing is, <laughs> he probably wouldn't take <laughs> my <laughs> advice. <laughs> <laughs> if you tell him something that he needs to do something well in your case he yeah. wouldn't question you but he, he, to, be, if, to be fair elo when it comes to advice and game suggestions doesn't necessarily matter i see a lot of bad takes from people that are pretty high elo and i see a lot of good takes from people with low elo well, so you know stevie's gonna clip that it's gonna replay every it's time true. <laughs> it's true <laughs> every time somebody tells him that he doesn't know what he's doing he's gonna show him that clip in any case, Viper, we're going to set it up all uh, to have the interview with Tony right now. Mm -hmm. This was fun as always, my friend. I, and uh, I'll take the opportunity to wish you a uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Thank New you. Year. Likewise to you as well Bye. and to all the viewers. To all the viewers as well. As well. All right, folks, and we're back, and we're now joined by Tonio Schachinga. He's been awarded the Deutsche Buch Preis, sorry about my German, for the best German novel in 2023. Uh, but on top of being an award-winning author, those of you who had the opportunity and the pleasure to read his excellent book, Echt Zeitalter, you'll know he's also a big fan of Age of Empires too. Tonio, thank you so much for taking the time to be here, and welcome to the Town Center. Thanks very much for having me. Okay, Tony, so first of all, congratulations on the prize and on the book. I enjoyed the book a lot. Uh, it was pretty tough for me to read it in German, but, you know, I just plowed through. And what I liked the most about the book was that it's a, it's a very bittersweet book. You know, I think that's very fitting, though, because it's exactly how I feel like most boys experience puberty. You know, puberty is not always like this happy moment <laughs> in life or something. There's a lot of bittersweetness. And I feel like this book catches that perfectly. So, Tonio, I assume this prize was obviously a big deal for you, but I wonder how big of a deal was it? Is it like the kind of prize that completely turns your life upside down and you're now living a completely different life? Or is it just exactly the same it was before? Well, my, my first novel was nominated for, for the same prize and mm. shortlisted also. So I kind of knew the um, environment. Um, but um, th there's a big difference between winning and being a finalist so yeah it, economically that it's a big uh it's a big difference mm -hmm. but in terms of how it changed your life is it like totally different now do you have a lot more engagement uh, do you feel like there are a lot of people that are interested in your work now all of a sudden how much has it changed yeah it changed a little bit i mean with the first novel i when i published it i was just a student who had written a book so the change was bigger maybe from being a student to being a public uh, person. Interesting. And now it's mm -hmm. it's a public person. Like the difference is that now everything you say can has more impact. Right, so right. it's kind of dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so from my understanding, I mean, full transparency, I didn't read the book, but obviously I've, I mean, the rumor started spreading as soon as we heard, oh, this guy wrote a book and it's inspired by Age of Empires and it won the literary prize, right? It's the word spread in the Age of Empires community. So it's like from us coming from Age of Empires, it's kind of like an honor as well that there's been a book written sure. with For the sure. inspiration. So like how did the inspiration come about? Like do you play Age of Empires yourself or did you are you just familiar with the game? How did that whole process like start even? Well, I played as a child. I mm -hmm. remember playing it with ten years on on the laptop of some co-worker of my mom's, I think. <laughs> and then I had the game at home and it, I played it, but mostly with cheats. I think I never yeah. found out how to play it properly. Uh, right. And then I I didn't um, I didn't have a lot of interactions with uh, AOE until maybe 2018 hmm. when I discovered um, T90. T90 oh. was the one who brought me back to, to a AOE. And I saw, I think it was even uh, Forest Nothing um, uh -huh. of course. <laughs> dragged me back in. <laughs> of course. And then it I was. Spent, some, spent the winter holidays watching all the T90 videos I could find. And then afterwards, I watched the stream until he went to Facebook. Then I kind of uh, mm. stopped watching because um, it wasn't that great for me. I had just deleted my Facebook um, oh. a couple of months earlier. So. Um, without an account, it wasn't so great to watch. Yeah. Um, and now, since both you and uh, tonight are back streaming, um, I, I have more time to, to watch again. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty clear you also follow the tournaments. For those of us who actually read the book, it was pretty... <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> it's pretty clear uh, you, watch, you actually follow the tournaments, too. Uh, I used to watch a lot, um, and I, I had this feeling watching Leary um, as an Austrian. Mm. I kind of felt... Uh, 
a patriotism I normally don't feel unless it's sport. I like I like football. I like also yeah. tennis. <laughs> and I think the time when I started watching uh, t- t- AOE tournaments a lot was the time when Dominic Thiem, the Austrian tennis player, was also mm. he was maybe comparable to Leary at the time. They were yeah. maybe top eight players, but they could win against the number one and number two. Mm-hmm. But then they would maybe throw a, ga- a game against somebody. Uh, who's a little bit uh, further down the line. So I, I saw some parallels between them. Also, this uh, Dominic Team, this uh, Austrian tennis player, he always lost the first uh, set. Right. Always. And <laughs> with Liri, it's always... Um, sometimes he also had a slow start and then had yeah. to come back uh, into the game. So was... Uh, I mean, like, the main character is called Till, right? And the general uh, sense there is, like, he is inspired by Liri. Is that actually the case? Um, as far as um, he's concerned as a player, yes, because um, he's young, he's Austrian, he's very mm. good. Also, the, his style of play was inspired by Leary. But everything else, everything that's biographical, yeah. is not inspired by Leary. I, okay. I um, yeah. I, uh, that's I, interesting, though. Is that a conscious decision, Tonio? Because from what I understand, you didn't actually contact Leary or anything, right? So no, were, no. were you trying to avoid making Till too much like Leary and you wanted him to just be his own personality? Or, or what, what was the uh, decision yeah. like there? Yeah, I mean, I found out a little bit about Leary. I found out where he lives and what kind of school he went to. And then I realized, mm-hmm. okay, um, this is going to have nothing to do with him. And then I mm. thought uh, better not contact him because if you contact him, um, then it it, uh, it seems as if it had anything to do with him, which it yeah. doesn't. So, um, mm-hmm. Is uh, the other guy you mentioned, like Dominic, I didn't catch his n- last name. Was he also part of the inspiration in this story then? Since you compared uh, the situation with him as well, as same as Leary. Yeah, a little bit. It's a little bit about the Austrian mentality. I okay. Think, um, mm-hmm. That you can see a footballer, you can see a, a tennis player, and then an AOE pro. Mm-hmm. And then if they're all Austrian, you can you can assume maybe that's something they have in common. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Austrian mentality thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, Tonio, I was very surprised to see how much Age of Empires there is in the book. It feels like you didn't hold back at all, you know? You describe certain strategies, you describe what 11 is and what 14 mean. Then there's obviously tons of cameos. You have Viper making an appearance, you have T90, MBL. Well, in the case of MBL, one is not entirely sure, but uh, weren't you afraid that talking so much about a computer game and going to the nerdy details of the game would actually scare some readers away? Because it's just a type of world and language that a lot of people are not familiar with, right? Well, it definitely scares some people away or maybe some people who are interested in other parts of the book uh, get a little bit uh, frustrated with the lengthy um, AOE uh, (laughs) stuff. But that's fine. That's that's okay with me. And I mean, I did hold back to some extent. I had a chapter that maybe the only chapter I really um, I had to delete completely, (laughs) but not. I, my first reader is my wife and then my agent and both of them they said okay this is not this is too much yeah, what was was there? Like, yeah, can you tell us more about it yeah it, uh, it's a chapter called it was called uh, the history of aoe oh, and it tells the story from the first tournament um in uh washington when they flew the players the world there. cyber games uh-huh. yeah 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 the world cyber games Sick. and then all the story from then to um you you're featured heavily in this chapter because um, the Viper because um, there was Viper. Oh, so, no, oh I didn't me. It. I, I thought it was me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can send it send it to you guys if you want. That would be awesome, <laughs> actually. Yeah, I read that you you're a big uh, uh, Lord of the Rings fan. Yes, that it was the Lord of the Rings mod that brought you back into the game, and then that your dad uh, was a, or is a, um, a very important figure in in mm. AOE. For and sure. I think the comparison I drew was to Ar- Aragorn from Lord ah. of the Rings, You're like the Aragorn from of AOE, <laughs> who got, come, came back to the game. Like that. That's actually insane. I would I would love to get that chapter and read it honestly, if you if you would be so kind. That'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So awesome. You, so you did hold back a little bit. That's that's <laughs> that's interesting. Actually, I like that. I'm Ar- Aragorn. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can see it. Yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, at some point in the book. 
uh, Antonio, you spend like six pages talking about T90. So you already said uh, you're a big fan of him. But I wonder, was it also a way of you trying to make a lot of people who are not familiar with this type of world to sort of connect them to the world of Age of Empires? Because I feel like what T90 does and what casters do are something that a lot of people can understand because they know it from sports, like sports mm. commentary. So was that maybe a way for you to sort of bridge the gap between readers and the world of AOE? Yeah, I mean, readers in general are quite old and um, mostly female. So the typical reader is a woman between 50 and 60, I think. Oh, so, she's going to be scared um, away by T90, though. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the the premise of the book was that it, it should be written in a way that somebody who's not from the scene or even um, young can understand. So it's like a transfer of uh, knowledge a little bit. And right. I mean, if you're familiar with uh, streaming and Twitch and stuff like that, um, it doesn't matter if you're familiar with, with AOE, you get it. But if you live in a completely different world, um, then you might not get it get it as much. So I tried to explain a little bit um, to to the general public so that they would also have an idea of what... Because mostly um, when, I, when I have uh, readings, stuff like that, there's always one or two AOE fans that uh, come to me afterwards. Really? Mostly it's... It's parents of children or young young yeah. people who play, and then they come and they say, "Ah, my my nephew plays this game and stuff like that." So that's that's the core audience, I would say, for for, for the book. Awesome! Mm. That's actually so funny. So the book is like multi-purpose. It's also the story, and also teaching people about the ways of the in quotes youth youth today. Was it was the was it always going to be the case that Till was playing Age of Empires? Was that like always the case? Because your history with Age of Empires, or did you ever consider like this story to be like maybe in another game or like taking another turn? Was it like you always had the vision of it was going to be Age of Empires? It was going to be Till. It was going to be like this. It it was always going to be Age of Empires. I just wanted to write about it after I had mm. spent one or two years watching those streams. I started writing in I think in May of 2020, so I had been. Uh, very immersed in this uh, in AOE for for around two years, and um, I just wanted to write about it. And then afterwards, this school stuff uh, came along because I realized, okay, if this player is so young, he has to attend school. Mm, so, right. and then I, uh, the book is mainly about the school. I would say, uh, right, uh, right. So, right. it it took a different path than what I had imagined maybe but that's okay. i think that's normal that's interesting. did it then like as you were writing the book did the story change compared to like how you originally envisioned it mm, a little bit i had always envisioned it being eight years like from the start okay. uh, of, of a secondary school until the end um that was the main plot plot idea yeah. i had and afterwards i just let myself be surprised by what Okay. what happens <laughs> that's, that's and i so wanted to write a lot more about aoe i had um I had three or uh, four notebooks full of uh aoe stuff i wanted to include and then as i uh, as i continued writing i realized you can't put everything yeah. in, in it <laughs> makes sense that's uh, awesome. something that i always also wondered tonio you use the real name of some players so viper uh there's tato there's doubt there's t90 but for others, you describe them in a way that we in the community can sort of guess who they might be. So MBL is MVB. Uh, then you have Hera. Hera is Beta. <laughs> and Nikov is Mari. Um, what was the decision process like there? Why do we have real names for some people and not for others? Well, I thought that the, the ones that appear more and the, that they say stuff and do stuff, um, I had to change the names. That's what I felt because Mm. Uh, the Viper appears, but the only thing he does is he tells when? Till that uh, he he played well, so okay. that's okay, I think. But then um, when Till has this training session with his uh, peers, I thought, okay, I can't I can't say they they said this if if that it's real people who didn't say Interesting. it. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. um, I kind of changed the names so that you could um, understand who who they're supposed to be, mm -hmm. but without implying um, that. They said this or they said that. Um, okay. With tonight, it's mostly stuff he said in videos and in streams. So it's true. I, I thought it was fine. Um, yeah. So yeah. tonight, the quotes are real, essentially. From the like, I think so. Well, okay. yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. but I mean, uh, yeah. So essentially, the reason you did not use the real names for those, were those people that were closer to Till, so to say. 
Yes, and that have more lines uh, yeah. in the book. That um, makes sense, actually. Yeah. yeah, it's funny because MVB, MBL. We know it's MBL because uh, you know he's a driving instructor or he's studying to be a driver instructor. <laughs> That's something that Tony included. And then Hera. Well, Hera in the book, he's or Beta, as he's called in the book. He's a Mexican Canadian, which I thought was funny. Oh, uh, he's not. He's not. Uh, I think Hera. Uh, his parents were born uh, in Palestine. If I'm something not mistaken, like that. Yeah. Right? yeah. So it became. Um, and Nikov, I don't know why I know that's Nikov. Uh, because he said he was an Argentinian who lives in Italy. So he, yes. he gave enough ah. that people in the community <laughs> know who they are. Uh, but people who don't know them wouldn't be able to, to sort of Google them, which I think is very interesting. Were, were you expecting that the, once the book got out, released, did you expect that the community would like notice and catch it and that the word would spread in the Age of Empires community as well? I wasn't really sure. I, um, I remember watching the... Um, watching your videos um, as well. And then I saw in the back, you had a book in German where it said uh, Klaviermusik or something like that. <laughs> so I thought, oh, you might you might speak German. And then I, I read this interview of yours in, uh, on AOISO. Mm. Uh, and there you tell that you live in Germany. And that's why I made my, uh, my edi editor send you a book mm -hmm. or ask you if you want to have the book sent because I realized that that's not... Um, I mean that's a good. That's one of the great things about AOE, this international community, where you yeah. have somebody from Argentina and I don't know. I'm my my par my mom is from Latin America, so mm -hmm. um, I kind of also like this aspect of people in Peru, Chile, uh, playing it uh, a lot. And then, the, of course, they don't speak German, so I thought the audience for the book is gonna be really limited. Mm -hmm. I think Nili was the only one I knew that uh, definitely spoke German. Right. But, Jordan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so Jordan, interesting. Yeah. The story you just talked about. I, I'm actually a little bit embarrassed to talk about it, but uh, now that you're here, I'll talk about it. So yeah, your agent, which I didn't know it was your agent, he sent me a copy or she sent me a copy of your book back in March, I think. And I was just like, I'm a nobody. Why is anyone sending a book to me? And I, was, I didn't even reply because I thought it was a scam or something. And, you know, it, did, it was not from you. It was from your agent. So it was like, what is this? I just didn't reply because it didn't think. And then a few months later, I hear the book that mm -hmm. I got that email from has actually won the prize. So it was real. Yeah. It was not a scam. So Tony, sorry, I, mean, I didn't, I didn't respond. I didn't read the book because I thought it was all a scam. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's good. I think you should be really careful with scams. So yeah. anybody listening, <laughs> in case you're getting an email, um, be ca better be careful than. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So something I'm also curious about, Tonio, uh, you, you just sort of touched on it. So you said you wanted to write a book about Age of Empires 2. And from that starting point, you sort of start thinking about the rest of the story. So if it's a computer game, it's probably going to be a young guy. If it's going to be a young guy, it's probably he needs to go to school. Then I need to describe how things are in school. So you sort of start from a very specific point and you start expanding the story outwards or zooming out or whatever. And I have no idea about the creating process, the creative process of making a book, but I always thought you would go the other way around. You think about a large topic you want to talk about, and then you start zooming in and sort of thinking about the details of a story. Um, how how was your experience doing this? Do you always write it this way, that you think about the details and then just let the story develop by itself? Uh, or how do you usually go about writing a book? That's really hard to describe, actually. Um, I don't know. With my first novel um, about this football player, I I was uh, the starting point was the person, the like the character, and then everything that happens. Um, just um, I I knew that it's going to be a professional football player because I was really interested in this uh, discrepancy between um, what they say in interviews and uh, mm -hmm. that's basically nothing, and then what what they might be thinking during. And um, with the second book, it was, I don't know, it's really hard to describe how, how it comes about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, that's a bad answer. No, that's fine. That's a good answer. I mean, that, it makes sense. It will be different for every person. There's right? no process. Yeah. It's just, just the way it is. I just always imagined it would be the other way around. Yeah. You think about something broad and then you go into the details. Yeah. But it's... Can I ask, since you mentioned Lord of the Rings earlier, are you also a Tolkien fan then? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, not, not um, fanatic. Yeah. Not a fanatic one, but I I love the I love the books. Mm -hmm. I love love the films also, but the books a uh, lot I like a yeah. lot more. Cool. And uh, I read some of the Silmarillion and okay. um, stuff like that. Fear knows blah blah blah. But yeah. 
I'm not a not a not a not a not, a, not an expert, right? Did you did you grow up always like on more on a personal level? Did you always grow up like having liking books, liking reading, and liking writing? Was that something that came like from an early age, or is it something that came later on? Um, yeah, I did. I did like it. Um, I read a lot as a child. I had this uh, card for the uh, public um, library, library, so yeah. I could get all the books I want. Mm. And um, I found out as like maybe with the 10, 11 years that if you if you get books, nobody checks if it's age appropriate. So uh -huh. <laughs> games and music and stuff like that, people would say, no, that you can't listen to that. You can't watch yeah. that. While with books, my parents, they were not really super Makes into sense. books. So they were just happy I was reading and they didn't care if it's something that's uh, way too uh, sexual, for example. Yeah. Uh, really, yeah. <laughs> that's actually clever. I didn't that's, think yeah, about that. Yeah, clever way. Very good. Uh, Tony, you, so before we let you go, you told us you didn't have too much time to follow the Age of Empire scene last year. Uh, what about next year? NAC5 is just coming. Will we have the chance to watch it? And Larry will be there. Maybe even show up on a LAN event. Maybe some even show up. Yeah, that's in... March, no, no, early January. It's Jan gonna be yeah. this year. At January, yeah, I'm going to uh, visit my grandmother in Ecuador for two mm -hmm. months, so oh, I'll well, be, well. Um, I'll be there in January, February. But I'll, I'll hope um, to be able to watch mm -hmm. next year. I, I'm, I'm gonna have more time. This year was really stressful for me, so I couldn't Obviously. enjoy it as much. But if I have more time, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get back into it. Okay. I started playing a little bit the last days and it was uh, really nice. Really um, nice. Do you That's play a multiplayer or just with single player? Um, mostly single player, but the last days my friend has COVID now, so he has a lot Ooh. of time and ah. then we played some multiplayer matches. Okay, and cool. it was really great to get get back into it. Did you win? I won the first two, and then he kind of figured me out. He's a lot. He's better than me, but he has a okay. lower elo because right. he plays more on multiplayer. So, <laughs> but we're. I mean, my, my elo is around thousand, so it's really perfect. Uh, it's solid, it's... low elo legend scenario. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to ask one thing more about the book. Like, is the chapter of Till completed, or is there a chance for a sequel? I think that's that's it. Okay, I'm chapter not is completed. Continue with it. Yeah. What, what about an older guy from Age of Empires, maybe from Norway or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's. I, I'm just joking. It's going to have a spin-off, definitely. Okay. Uh, spin -off. <laughs> awesome. Tony, thank you so much for your time. It was awesome to have you here and wish you lots of continued success. Thanks very much for having me and have a great day. Thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Tony.